The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume One by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section Five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume One by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section Five. First Book, Part Three but an extraordinary event deeply disturbed the boy's peace of mind for the first time on the first of november seventeen fifty five the earthquake at lisbon took place and spread a prodigious alarm over the world long accustomed to peace and quiet a great and magnificent capital which was at the same time a trading and mercantile city is smitten without warning by a most fearful calamity the earth trembles and totters the sea foams ships dash together houses fall in and over them churches and towers the royal palace is in part swallowed by the waters the bursting land seems to vomit flames and smoke and fire are seen everywhere amid the ruins Sixty thousand persons, a moment before in ease and comfort, fall together. And he is to be deemed most fortunate who is no longer capable of a thought or feeling about the disaster. The flames rage on, and with them rage a troop of desperadoes, before concealed or set at large by the event. The wretched survivors are exposed to pillage, massacre, and every outrage. And thus, on all sides, nature asserts her boundless capriciousness. Intimations of this event had spread over wide regions more quickly than the authentic reports. Slight shocks had been felt in many places, in many springs, particularly those of a mineral nature, an unusual receding of the waters had been remarked, and so much the greater was the effect of the accounts themselves which were rapidly circulated, at first in general terms, that finally with dreadful particulars. Hereupon the religious were neither wanting in reflections, nor the philosophic in grounds for consolation, nor the clergy in warnings. So complicated an event arrested the attention of the world for a long time and as additional and more detailed accounts of the extensive effects of this explosion came from every quarter the minds already aroused by the misfortunes of strangers began to be more and more anxious about themselves and their friends perhaps the demon of terror had never so speedily and powerfully diffused his terrors over the earth the boy who was compelled to put up with frequent repetitions of the whole matter was not a little staggered god the creator and preserver of heaven and earth whom the explanation of the first article of the creed declared so wise and benignant having given both the just and the unjust to pray to the same destruction had not manifested himself by any means in a fatherly character in vain the young mind strove to resist these impressions it was the more impossible as the wise and scripture learned could not themselves agree as to the light in which such a phenomenon should be regarded the next summer gave a closer opportunity of knowing directly that angry god of whom the old testament records so much a sudden hailstorm accompanied by thunder and lightning violently broke the new panes at the back of our house which looked towards the west damaged the new furniture destroyed some valuable books and other things of worth and was the more terrible to the children as the whole household quite beside themselves dragged them into a dark passage where on their knees with 
frightful groans and cries they thought to conciliate the wrathful deity meanwhile my father who was the only one self-possessed forced open and unhinged the window frames by which we saved much glass but made a broader inlet for the rain that followed the hail so that after we were finally quieted we found ourselves in the rooms and on the stairs completely surrounded by floods and streams of water these events startling as they were on the whole did not greatly interrupt the course of instruction which my father himself had undertaken to give us children he had passed his youth in the coburg gymnasium which stood as one of the first among german educational institutions he had there laid a good foundation in languages and other matters reckoned part of a learned education had subsequently applied himself to jurisprudence at leipzig and had at last taken his degree at gießen his dissertation Electa de Addicione Hereditatis, which had been earnestly and carefully written, is still cited by jurists with approval. It is a pious wish of all fathers to see what they themselves fail to attain realized in their sons, as if in this way they could live their lives over again, and at last make a proper use of their early experience conscious of his acquirements with the certainty of baseful perseverance and distrusting the teachers of the day my father undertook to instruct his own children allowing them to take particular lessons from particular masters only so far as it seemed absolutely necessary a pedagogical dilettantism was already beginning to show itself everywhere the pedantry and heaviness of the masters appointed in the public schools had probably given rise to this evil. Something better was sought for, but it was forgotten how defective all instruction must be, which is not given by persons who are teachers by profession. My father had prospered in his own career tolerably, according to his wishes, I was to follow the same course, only more easily and much farther. He prized my natural endowments the more, because he was himself wanting in them, for he had acquired everything only by means of unspeakable diligence, pertinacity, and repetition. He often assured me, early and late, both in jest and earnest, that with my talents he would have deported himself very differently and would not have turned them to such small account by means of a ready apprehension practice and a good memory i very soon outgrew the instructions which my father and the other teachers were able to give without being thoroughly grounded in anything grammar displeased me because i regarded it as a mere arbitrary law the rules seemed ridiculous inasmuch as they were invalidated by so many exceptions which had all to be learned by themselves and if the first latin work had not been in rhyme i should have got on but badly in that but as it was i hummed and sang it to myself readily enough in the same way we had a geography in memory verses in which the most wretched doggerel best served to fix the recollection of that which was to be retained for example upper isle has many a fen which makes it hateful to all men the forms and inflections of language i caught with ease and i also quickly unravelled what lay in the conception of a thing in rhetoric composition and such matters no one excelled me although i was often put back for faults of grammar yet these were the attempts that gave my father particular pleasure and for which he rewarded me with many presents of money considerable for such a lad my father taught my sister italian in the same room in which i had to commit celarius to memory as i was soon ready with my task 
and was yet obliged to sit quiet, I listened with my book before me, and very readily caught the Italian, which struck me as an agreeable softening of Latin. Other precocities, with respect to memory and the power to combine, I possessed in common with those children who thus acquire an early reputation. For that reason my father could scarcely wait for me to go to college. He very soon declared that I must study jurisprudence in Leipzig, for which he retained a strong predilection, and I was afterwards to visit some other university and take my degree. As for this second one, he was indifferent as to which I might choose, except that he had for some reason or other a disinclination to Göttingen. To my disappointment, since it was precisely there that I had placed such confidence and high hopes. He told me further that I was to go to Wetzlar and Ratisbon, as well as to Vienna, and thence towards Italy, although he repeatedly mentioned that Paris should first be seen, because after coming out of Italy, nothing else could be pleasing. These tales of my future youthful travels, often as they were repeated, I listened to eagerly, the more so as they always led to accounts of Italy, and at last to a description of Naples. His otherwise serious and dry manner seemed on these occasions to relax and quicken, and thus a passionate wish awoke in us children to participate in the paradise he described. Private lessons, which now gradually multiplied, were shared with the children of the neighbours. This learning in common did not advance me. The teachers followed their routine and the rudeness, sometimes the ill-nature, of my companions interrupted the brief hours of study with tumult, vexation, and disturbance. Crestomacies, by which learning is made pleasant and varied, had not yet reached us. Cornelius Nepos, so dry to young people, the New Testament, which was much too easy, and which, by preaching and religious instructions, had been rendered even commonplace, Celarius and Passor could impart no kind of interest. On the other hand, a certain rage for rhyme and versification, a consequence of reading the prevalent German poets, took complete possession of us. Me it had ceased much earlier, as I had found it agreeable to pass from the rhetorical to the poetical treatment of subjects. We boys held a Sunday assembly where each of us was to produce original verses. And here I was struck by something strange which long caused me uneasiness. My poems, whatever they might be, had always seemed to me the best. But I soon remarked that my competitors, who brought forth very lame affairs, were in the same condition, and thought no less of themselves. Nay, what appeared yet more suspicious, a good lad, though in such matters altogether unskilful, whom I liked in other respects, to had his rhymes made by his tutor, not only regarded these as the best, but was thoroughly persuaded they were his own, as he always maintained in our confidential intercourse. Now, as this allusion and error was obvious to me, the question one day forced itself upon me whether I myself might not be in the same state, whether those poems were not really better than mine, and whether I might not justly appear to those boys as mad as they to me. This disturbed me much and long, for it was altogether impossible for me to find any external criterion of the truth. I even ceased from producing until at length I was quieted by my own light temperament, and the feeling of my own powers, and lastly by a trial of skill, started on the spur of the moment by our teachers and parents who had noted our sport, in which I came off well and won general praise. 
no libraries for children had at that time been established the old had themselves still childish notions and found it convenient to impart their own education to their successors except the orbis pictus of amos comenius no book of the sort fell into our hands but the large folio bible with copper plates by merian was diligently gone over leaf by leaf gottfried's chronicles with plates by the same master taught us the most notable events of universal history the acera philologica added thereto all sorts of fables mythologies and wonders and as i soon became familiar with ovid's metamorphoses the first books of which in particular i studied carefully my young brain was rapidly furnished with a mass of images and events of significant and wonderful shapes and occurrences and i never felt time hang upon my hands as i always occupied myself in working over repeating and reproducing these acquisitions a more salutary moral effect than that of these rude and hazardous antiquities was produced by Fenelong's Telemachus, with which I first became acquainted in Neukirch's translation, and which, imperfectly as it was executed, had a sweet and beneficent influence on my mind. That Robinson Crusoe was added in due time follows in the nature of things, and it may be imagined that the island of Falsenburg was not wanting lord anson's voyage round the globe combined the dignity of truth with the rich fancies of fable and while our thoughts accompanied this excellent seaman we were conducted over all the world and endeavoured to follow him with our fingers on the globe but a still richer harvest was to spring up before me when i lighted on a mass of writings which in their present state it is true cannot be called excellent but the contents of which in a harmless way bring near to us many a meritorious action of former times the publication or rather the manufacture of those books which have at a later day become so well known and celebrated under the name volkschriften volksbücher popular works or books was carried on in frankfurt the enormous sales they met with led to their being almost illegibly printed from stereotypes on horrible blotting paper we children were so fortunate as to find these precious remains of the middle ages every day on a little table at the door of a dealer in cheap books and to obtain them at the cost of a couple of kreutzer the eulenspiegel the four sons of Hymon, the emperor Octavian, the fair Melusina, the beautiful Magalone, Fortunatus, with the whole race down to the wandering Jew, were all at our service, as often as we preferred the relish of these works to the taste of sweet things. The greatest benefit of this was that when we had read through or damaged such a sheet, it could soon be reprocured and swallowed a second time as a family picnic in summer is vexatiously disturbed by a sudden storm which transforms the pleasant state of things into the very reverse so the diseases of childhood fall unexpectedly on the most beautiful season of early life and thus it happened with me i had just purchased fortunatus with his purse and wishing hat when i was attacked by a restlessness and fever which announced the smallpox inoculation was still with us considered very problematical and although it had already been intelligibly and urgently recommended by popular writers the german physicians hesitated to perform an operation that seemed to forestall nature speculative englishmen therefore had come to the continent and inoculated for a considerable fee 
the children of such persons as were opulent and free from prejudices still the majority were exposed to the old disease the infection raged through families killed and disfigured many children and few parents dared to avail themselves of a method the probable efficacy of which had been abundantly confirmed by the result the evil now invaded our house and attacked me with unusual severity my whole body was sewn over with spots and my face covered and for several days i lay blind and in great pain they tried the only possible alleviation and promised me heaps of gold if i would keep quiet and not increase the mischief by rubbing and scratching i controlled myself while according to the prevailing prejudice they kept me as warm as possible and thus only rendered my suffering more acute at last after a woeful time there fell as it were a mask from my face the blotches had left no visible mark upon the skin but the features were plainly altered i myself was satisfied merely with seeing the light of day again and gradually putting off my spotted skin but others were pitiless enough to remind me often of my previous condition especially a very lively aunt who had formerly regarded me with idolatry but in after years could seldom look at me without exclaiming the deuce cousin what a fright he's grown then she would tell me circumstantially how i had once been her delight and what attention she had excited when she carried me about and thus i early learned that people very often subject us to a severe atonement for the pleasure which we have afforded them i escaped neither measles nor chickenpox nor any other of the tormenting demons of childhood and i was assured each time that it was a great piece of good luck that this malady was now past for ever but alas another again threatened in the background and advanced all these things increased my propensity to reflection and as i had already practised myself in fortitude in order to remove the torture of impatience the virtues which i had heard praised in the stoics appeared to me highly worthy of imitation and the more so as something similar was commended by the christian doctrine of patience while on the subject of these family diseases i will mention a brother about three years younger than myself who was likewise attacked by that infection and suffered not a little from it he was of a tender nature quiet and capricious and we were never on the most friendly terms besides he scarcely survived the years of childhood among several other children born afterwards who like him did not live long i only remember a very pretty and agreeable girl who also soon passed away so that after the lapse of some years my sister and i remained alone and were therefore the more deeply and affectionately attached to each other these maladies and other unpleasant interruptions were in their consequences doubly grievous for my father who seemed to have laid down for himself a certain calendar of education and instruction was resolved immediately to repair every delay and impose double lessons upon the young convalescent these were not hard for me to accomplish but were so far troublesome that they hindered and to a certain extent repressed my inward development which had taken a decided direction from these didactic and pedagogic oppressions we commonly fled to my grandfather and grandmother their house stood in the friedberg street and appeared to have been formerly a fortress for on approaching it nothing was seen but a large gate with battlements which were joined on either side to the two neighbouring houses 
on entering through a narrow passage we reached at last a tolerably wide court surrounded by irregular buildings which were all now united into one dwelling we usually hastened at once into the garden which extended to a considerable length and breadth behind the buildings and was very well kept the walks were mostly skirted by vine trellises one part of the space was used for vegetables and another devoted to flowers which from spring till autumn adorned in rich succession the borders as well as the beds the long wall erected towards the south was used for some well-trained espalier peach trees the forbidden fruit of which ripened temptingly before us through the summer yet we rather avoided this side because we here could not satisfy our dainty appetites and we turned to the side opposite where an interminable row of currant and gooseberry bushes furnished our veracity with a succession of harvests till autumn not less important to us was an old high wide-spreading mulberry tree both on account of its fruits and because we were told that the silkworms fed upon its leaves in this peaceful region my grandfather was found every evening tending with genial care and with his own hand the finer growths of fruits and flowers while a gardener managed the drudgery he was never vexed by the various toils which were necessary to preserve and increase the fine show of pinks the branches of the peach trees were carefully tied to the espaliers with his own hands in a fan shape in order to bring about a full and easy growth of the fruit the sorting of the bulbs of tulips hyacinths and plants of a similar nature as well as the care of their preservation he entrusted to none and i still with pleasure recall to my mind how diligently he occupied himself in inoculating the different varieties of roses that he might protect himself from the thorns he put on a pair of those ancient leather gloves of which three pair were given him annually at the piper's court so that there was no dearth of the article he wore also a loose dressing-gown and a folded black velvet cap upon his head so that he might have passed for an intermediate person between alcinois and laertes all this work in the garden he pursued as regularly and with as much precision as his official business for before he came down he always arranged the list of cases for the next day and read the legal papers in the morning he proceeded to the city hall dined after his return then took a nap in his easy chair and so went through the same routine every day he conversed little never exhibited any vehemence and i do not remember ever to have seen him angry all that surrounded him was in the fashion of the olden time i never perceived any alteration in his wainscoted room his library contained besides law works only the earliest books of travels sea voyages and discoveries of countries altogether i can call to mind no situation more adapted than his to awaken the feeling of uninterrupted peace and eternal duration but the reverence we entertained for this venerable old man was raised to the highest degree by a conviction that he possessed the gift of prophecy especially in matters that pertain to himself and his destiny it is true he revealed himself to no one distinctly and minutely except to my grandmother yet we were all aware that he was informed of what was going to happen by significant dreams he assured his wife for instance at a time when he was still a junior councillor that on the first vacancy he would obtain the place left open on the bench of the Sherpin and soon afterwards when one of those officers actually died of apoplexy my grandfather gave orders that his house should be quietly got ready prepared on the day of electing and balloting 
to receive his guests and congratulate us. Sure enough, the decisive gold ball was drawn in his favour. The simple dream by which he had learned this he confided to his wife as follows. He had seen himself in the ordinary full assembly of councilmen, where all went on just as usual. Suddenly, the late Schirp rose from his seat, descended the steps, pressed him in the most complimentary manner to take the vacant place, and then departed by the door. Something similar occurred on the death of the Schultheis. They make no delay in supplying this place, as they always have to fear that the emperor will, at some time, resume his ancient right of nominating the officer. On this occasion the messenger of the court came at midnight to summon an extraordinary session for the next morning, and as the light in his lantern was about to expire, he asked for a candle's end to help him on his way. Give him a whole one said my grandfather to the ladies. He takes the trouble all on my account. This expression anticipated the result. He was made Schultheis. And what rendered the circumstance particularly remarkable was that, although his representative was the third and last to draw at the ballot, the two silver balls first came out, leaving the golden ball at the bottom of the bag for him. Perfectly prosaic, simple, and without a trace of the fantastic or miraculous were the other dreams of which we were informed. Moreover, I remember that once, as a boy, I was turning over his books and memoranda, and found among some other remarks which related to gardening such sentences as these. Tonight N. N. came to me and said, the name and revelation being written in cipher, or this night I saw, all the rest being again in cipher, except the conjunctions and similar words from which nothing could be learned. It is worthy of note also that persons who showed no signs of prophetic insight at other times acquired for the moment, while in his presence, and that by means of some sensible evidence, presentiments of diseases or deaths which were then occurring in distant places. But no such gift has been transmitted to any of his children or grandchildren, who for the most part have been hearty people, enjoying life, and never going beyond the actual. While on this subject I remember with gratitude many kindnesses I received from them in my youth. Thus, for example, we were employed and entertained in many ways when we visited the second daughter, married to the druggist Melba, whose house and shop stood near the market in the midst of the liveliest and most crowded part of the town. There we could look down from the windows pleasantly enough upon the hurly-burly, in which we feared to lose ourselves. And though at first of all the goods in the shop nothing had much interest for us but the licorice, and the little brown stamped cakes made from it, we became in time better acquainted with the multitude of articles bought and sold in that business. This aunt was the most vivacious of all the family. Whilst my mother, in her early years, took pleasure in being neatly dressed, working at some domestic occupation, or reading a book, the other, on the contrary, ran about the neighbourhood to pick up neglected children, take care of them, comb them, and carry them about in the way she had done with me for a good while. At a time of public festivities such as coronations, it was impossible to keep her at home. When a little child, she had already scrambled for the money scattered on such occasions, and it was related of her that once, when she had got a good many together, and was looking at them with great delight in the palm of her hand, it was struck by somebody, and all her well-earned booty vanished at a blow. There was another incident of which she was very proud. Once, while standing on a post as the Emperor Charles the Seventh was passing, at a moment when all the people were silent, 
she shouted a vigorous vivat into the coach which made him take off his hat to her and thank her quite graciously for her bold salutation everything in her house was stirring lively and cheerful and we children owed her many a gay hour in a more quiet situation which was however suited to her character was a second aunt married to the pastor stark incumbent of st catherine's church he lived much alone in accordance with his temperament and vocation and possessed a fine library here i first became acquainted with homer in a prose translation which may be found in the seventh part of herr von Rohn's new collection of the most remarkable travels under the title homer's depiction of the conquest of the kingdom of troy ornamented with copper plates in the theatrical french taste these pictures perverted my imagination to such a degree that for a long time i could conceive the homeric heroes only under such forms the incidents themselves gave me unspeakable delight though i found great fault with the work for affording us no account of the capture of troy and breaking off so abruptly with the death of hector my uncle to whom i mentioned this defect referred me to virgil who perfectly satisfied my demands it will be taken for granted that we children had among our other lessons a continued and progressive instruction in religion but the church protestantism imparted to us was properly speaking nothing but a kind of dry morality ingenious exposition was not thought of and the doctrine appealed neither to the understanding nor to the heart for that reason there were various secessions from the established church separatists pietists Herrnhuter, moravians quiet in the land and others differently named and characterized sprang up all of whom are animated by the same purpose of approaching the deity especially through christ more closely than seemed to them possible under the forms of the established religion the boy heard these opinions and sentiments constantly spoken of for the clergy as well as the laity divided themselves into pro and con the minority were composed of those who dissented more or less broadly but their modes of thinking attracted by originality heartiness perseverance and independence all sorts of stories were told of their virtues and of the way in which they were manifested the reply of a pious master tinman was especially noted who when one of his craft attempted to shame him by asking who is really your confessor answered with great cheerfulness and confidence in the goodness of his cause i have a famous one no less than the confessor of king david things of this sort naturally made an impression on the boy and led him into similar states of mind in fact he came to the thought that he might immediately approach the great god of nature the creator and preserver of heaven and earth his earlier manifestations of wrath had been long forgotten in the beauty of the world and the manifold blessings in which we participate while upon it the way he took to accomplish this was very curious the boy had chiefly kept to the first article of belief the god who stands in immediate connection with nature and owns and loves it as his work seemed to him the proper god who might be brought into closer relationship with man as with everything else and who would take care of him as of the motion of the stars the days and seasons the animals and plants there were texts of the gospels which explicitly stated this the boy could ascribe no form to this being he therefore sought him in his works and would in the good old testament fashion build him 
an altar. Natural productions were set forth as images of the world, over which a flame was to burn, signifying the aspirations of man's heart towards his maker. He brought out of the collection of natural objects which he possessed, and which had been increased as chance directed, the best, ores and other specimens. But the next difficulty was as to how they should be arranged and raised into a pile. His father possessed a beautiful red lacquered music stand, ornamented with gilt flowers, in the form of a four-sided pyramid with different elevations, which had been found convenient for quartets, but lately was not much in use. The boy laid hands on this, and built up his representatives of nature, one above the other, in steps, so that it all looked quite pretty, and at the same time sufficiently significant. On an early sunrise his first worship of God was to be celebrated, but the young priest had not yet settled how to produce a flame which should at the same time emit an agreeable odour. At last it occurred to him to combine the two, as he possessed a few fumigating pastels, which diffused a pleasant fragrance with a glimmer, if not with a flame. Nay, this soft burning and exhalation seemed a better representation of what passes in the heart than an open flame. The sun had already risen for a long time, but the neighbouring houses concealed the east. At last it glittered above the roofs. A burning glass was at once taken up and applied to the pastels, which were fixed on the summit in a fine porcelain saucer. Everything succeeded according to the wish, and the devotion was perfect. The altar remained as a peculiar ornament of the room which had been assigned him in the new house. Every one regarded it only as a well-arranged collection of natural curiosities. The boy knew better, but concealed his knowledge. He longed for a repetition of the solemnity. But unfortunately, just as the most opportune sun arose, the porcelain cup was not at hand. He placed the pastels immediately on the upper surface of the stand. They were kindled, and so great was the devotion of the priest that he did not observe until it was too late the mischief his sacrifice was doing. The pastels had burned mercilessly into the red lacquer and beautiful gold flowers, and as if some evil spirit had disappeared, had left their black, ineffaceable footprints. By this the young priest was thrown into the most extreme perplexity. The mischief could be covered up, it was true, with the larger pieces of his show materials, but the spirit for new offerings was gone, and the accident might almost be considered a hint and warning of the danger there always is in wishing to approach the deity in such a way. End of section 5